states run an entire society. Wow. You know, his point was, if you're living on the moon, if somebody makes a mistake, you're living in a habitat and somebody uh, penetrates the barrier between you and outside, everybody could die. And so you may need a lot more social control for the society to survive. And you could say the same thing about Mars, that you could imagine at least initially it would be a very military kind of uh, discipline. But yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I think the, I think we'll have like mind control type things going on, uh, yeah. like in, in a very serious one. Not not. I don't mean that as a joke. Like I think uh, I think I mentioned it last time, to Cesar, to you and uh, your students that uh, I imagine you know this kind of um, being aware of people's mental states, whether it's how stressed they are, their emotions, you know, whether they're very tired, very angry, like all of this. You have to take it into account. You can't take you can't take a chance, right? Yeah, and I so think, that, yeah, yeah, so go ahead. Well, as an American, you know, all of that is just anathema to us, uh, in our culture. But, you, you know, it's a different world, diff literally a different world. And uh, it's really remarkable that so many people all over the world have given in to the restrictions that have been imposed uh, so far because of the virus. But... I mean, what, yeah, what? but but haven't the Americans as well? I mean, you guys have uh, followed, um, you know, the restrictions quite quite closely as well in a lot of places, no? Yeah, I was just saying that, that uh, rebellion is erupting right now. People are saying they're not going to obey the restrictions anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would expect that there would be rebellion about, you know, uh, like anger about the lack of um, health services or the lack of testing or the competence, the, like a rebellion against the lack of competence of the government, not, uh, not against, you know, having yeah. to stay at home, which makes uh, sense for epidemic. <laughs> Don't forget, you know, America was born in a revolution. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It was a rebellion, right? Right. Uh, but I mean, not every American is marching and demonstrating. A lot of people like me are obeying the orders and trying to be responsible. Uh, right. uh, but I think there's just going to be a limit to what people will put up with. Do you see a generational div divide that people of a certain age would be more likely to, to follow orders because it's also in the best, best health interest? Or you see like minorities who are disproportionate, disproportionately uh, uh, you know, impacted uh, or poor and minorities are, are dying at a much greater rate would be more likely to follow orders or the opposite? Well, so far the rebellions are being generated primarily by uh, people of a conservative political outlook. Uh -huh. well, so I don't know. Makes sense, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, where it will go from from there, but mm -hmm. you know, I I'm going to talk about this in my presentation. I think the really amazing thing is the fact that in the space of a month, we've just transformed the entire planet. Right. I mean, we really have. We've changed the entire planet in a month, and uh, that's really an interesting uh, lesson. And uh, the fact that the WHO, which is uh, you know the last kind of uh, um, rampart for having a, a cohesive strategy for uh, global health, is being defended by the main founder, the USA, is also like it's marking a severe shift in what's going to be the leadership of our global health. Um, yeah. And then we see that there's a there's a the rise of again like Chinese government being willing and having the ability to finance such large institutions that have far-reaching implication in everybody's uh, everyday mm -hmm. life. Yeah. yeah, That's gonna have a huge impact on how we live. I, I guess we'll find out how it plays out, right? It's, uh, it's a bit early to tell how the whole geopolitical landscape is gonna change now with, with the Americans withdrawing their funding and, and the Chinese okay. trying to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that um, They've only suspended it. Right. Well, hopefully that's what we, everybody <laughs> hopes, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think it's just, it's, it's just a temporary, again, a temporary protest against the way mm -hmm. uh, WHO handled 
the whole situation in the beginning. Right. Um, I think everybody's here. Ready to go? Yeah, Ready to roll. we can get started. Okay. Um, I will give a general introduction about the course and then I'll let uh, Dara and uh, Martin introduce you. Um, so I'm gonna share my, my screen as well. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, do you... Can you also give me a heads up maybe five minutes before you want me to stop for questions? Because oh. I can move more quickly through the PowerPoint if you tell me, hurry it up. Perfect. Um, you, you can tell us, we're rather flexible. You can tell us how, like, what is a comfortable amount of time for you to present. I don't want to rush you either. So you just tell us in advance, uh, like, do you think it's going to be more like 20 minutes or more like 45 minutes? We're flexible. I timed it out at 35. Perfect. So we'll let you know this when is, it's coming great. Out. Yeah, let me, but let me know if you, you know, if people are, it's, I know it's late over there. So people, I don't want people falling asleep on me. Oh, uh, teenagers. <laughs> nice okay. All right, good. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. So this uh, session is, uh, is being recorded. Um, so this is the Mars uh, Mind and Body Interface. This is the week two. Uh, we are very lucky to, uh, so I'm, I'm going to introduce the debris very, very uh, quickly. So the idea is that uh, we're going to go on Mars. And uh, it seems like uh, it can be very abstract, but uh, there's really significant progress being made, both in space faring technology, uh, also neuroscience and AI, and all those uh, kind of uh, emergent fields. And so uh, in the School of Architecture, in design, we have to think, how can we anticipate those changes and design for this future? This is an overview of the course uh, until the month of June. The students are going to be uh, having sessions where they create and they collaborate, uh, but and in which they're going to be designing those uh, future interface between mind and computers and maybe even brain to brain uh, interface in the future. Uh, this is the brief in a, in, a, in a sentence is that for the future of living on Mars, we're going to have to adapt uh, the human body and the human mind to this new environment. So we can't take for granted that, you know, we're just going to be terraforming Mars and everything is going to be <laughs> fine and just like Earth is going to take a long time. And this is going to be a complex process where uh, humans will adapt as well. And so we, we, we want to, to think about how this is going to look like. Uh, the way we've structured the course and the distribution of students, uh, because we're working with uh, Zara and, and Martin, uh, we really focus on more the neuroscience and the AI aspect of it. And so uh, we made a timeline of telecommunication devices from 1830, in, uh, when all the communication was done by horseback, uh, you know, male traditional, uh, 18, 1844, the revolution of the uh, Morse code and telegraphs, all the way up to current, you know, uh, iPhones. Um, and so you see that's the timeline. In the future, we will talk about like brain implants and genetic modification. Uh, and uh, we also match the population that they will be on Earth and the projected population that they might be uh, uh, on Mars. So those populations are, are projected. It's very hypothetical. Uh, however, uh, a lot of the technology that we talk about are already under development. So uh, there's a few things that we have a good amount of uh, uncertainty, you know, like, uh, uh, like uh, Fitbits kind of bracelets are already pretty common, um, but brain uh, helmets are not, like very few people wear it currently, but we expect in the future more people will be wearing it. Uh, like body and mind augmentation device, we think will become more um, uh, normal and probably necessary if you live in a, an environment that is as complicated and dangerous a, as Mars. So anyway, so the idea is that we project ourselves in the future, the size of Mars colonies, and then the students are grouped by time zones. You have two students in 2025, two students in 2030, 20, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is that each of the students has got to think of a technological advancement is the matching uh, population that is on Mars, and they are weaving a story with those different elements. How does the, the, the world looks like on Mars when you have 10 people there with this kind of technology at that kind of time? And so like this, we create a timeline of trying to invent what is the future of brain to computer or brain to brain technology in our future settlements. So that's the, that's the general framework of the course. So the students will be making um, accessories, uh, they'll be making devices, they'll be uh, creating storyboards, movies, they'll be telling all those stories. And the idea is that this is 
useful for our industrial partner, MIND, uh, useful for kind of more academic and research partner uh, with the London Mars Society. And this is very useful for the students to deal with real world and future constraint and truly interdisciplinary work. So uh, there will be three parts to this session today. Uh, first, we're gonna have a, a, an amazing speaker, uh, Professor Frank White. Then I'll make a quick uh, presentation about a friend of mine who used science fiction uh, to develop his company. He's raised several millions of dollars to uh, develop a holographic display. And I, I'll tell the story of his uh, business and how he's going to using sci-fi to talk to investor and to raise uh, capital. And then the students will present their illustration and their short stories. So that's my introduction. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. It's a great uh, privilege to have you. Uh, now I will pass it to uh, maybe Zara and Martin. If you want to give us some context, how did you guys meet? Zara, do you want to tell the story? Uh, yeah, so we were very lucky and privileged to uh, be introduced to uh, Frank White uh, through uh, Rachel, who works for um, Space for Humanity organization. Um, they're a really incredible organization where they're trying to kind of democratize access to space um, and uh, fund uh, flights for when they become available for uh, people from different backgrounds to go to space and to experience the overview of effect, which Frank will share more about, but this is the work that um, Frank has been focusing for many years now. Um, so that was kind of our initial, well, education on the concept of the overview effect and on the organization. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Martin, you want to add to, so. Uh, well, I just want to say, because uh, you mentioned Space for Humanity, and I don't want to make it about that, but that's a really cool uh, nonprofit organization and basically they're taking citizen astronauts they want to take citizen astronauts to space and they're starting i think the first launch is next year or two years from now so go check them out and apply uh to become a citizen astronaut if you're if you know if you're keen on that you can actually go and apply and you know they, it's a it's a all expenses paid trip if, if they take you yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea of the overview effect, uh, which I actually heard before, I heard the term and I, you know, I was really interested in this idea of kind of expanding consciousness and this awareness, but I never realized that there was a whole, you know, field dedicated to that. And then we were lucky to meet the person who's coined the term and who's done extensive research with astronauts. Um, and, you know, hopefully you've watched the video that we shared earlier, just to get a glimpse of um, Frank's work. And he's also published, he's an author so published various books which we haven't read all of them yet but the ones that we did um it's an incredible um experience yeah and for those of you that like sci-fi he's uh, co-published books with isaac asimov as well which I, I i think is kind of kind of cool <laughs> yeah frank maybe we'll let you share more about your journey i think there's a lot more that we I'm don't sure there's a lot of things <laughs> that we're missing uh that we haven't mentioned but yeah thanks for making time frank right. thanks for joining Thank you. Okay. Um, well, let me see if I can share my screen, make the technology work here. There should be a big green button uh, kind of in the center and it should say share screen with the, here we go. We got it. I think, I think I've got it here. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. So I have asked the student to prepare at least two questions per student, and then they're going to write their questions in the chat. Don't let this distract you. Uh, we just uh, will accumulate the question during the presentation, uh, and then you can choose the question that you that you feel are the most interesting at the end of your presentation. Okay, great. All right. So you can see the screen okay? Everything's good? Okay. Well, I will just say very briefly, um, I'm very fortunate and very privileged that I uh, was very interested in the work of Gerard K. O'Neill. Uh, if you haven't heard about him, you should look into what he did. He had a vision of uh, creating space settlements between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, he actually had a theory that putting settlements on planetary surfaces was not the optimum place for a settlement. We won't get into that today because we are assuming there will be people on Mars, but I was obsessing about his ideas. I was part of his Space Studies Institute flying cross country and trying to imagine what it would be like to not live on Earth, but to live in outer space. 
And I had this epiphany where I thought you would always have an overview of the earth. You would see it as a whole system. You would understand things that we've been trying to understand for hundreds, if not thousands of years. <clears throat> and I started interviewing astronauts to see what their experience was like. <clears throat> I'll tell you more about that, but I've now interviewed 41 astronauts. And of course, I've also read as much as I could about their experience. And today I'm gonna to talk about Mars in that context. I'm also very interested in artificial intelligence. I know you're working on that. I've actually written a book on that. And if I'm not going to get into it today because then the presentation would be the entire two hours, but I'm really excited that you're working on AI and technology, uh, technology for settlement. You know, let's start by imagining a world a different world, um, one where you are living inside all the time. Uh, let's imagine a world where you can't fly to wherever you want to go. It's a world where you risk your life to go outside. It's a world where you have to wear protective clothing just to leave your home. Is this world Mars? Well, today it's also the Earth, isn't it? In a very brief period of time, suddenly it's remarkable. Every human being is doing the same thing at the same time. I think you could imagine two months ago, what I was doing today, what you were doing today would be very different. But today, just about every person on the, on the planet is sheltering in place being very careful about leaving their house, wearing masks. There's been an incredible rapid change worldwide in just a few weeks. We're all living in a different way. And it really does show how resilient human beings are, that we could make such a dramatic change and adapt to what has suddenly become a different planet for us because of a virus. And let's not forget the virus is not an alien species. It is, viruses live here with us uh, and they can be our enemy and they can also be teachers. So in some ways I've talked to a lot of people that in many ways this restriction on us is perhaps a preparation for living on Mars where many of the same conditions will pertain. Uh, we're thinking a lot about design. I'd like for you to think about a great designer, Buckminster Fuller. Bucky was not just a designer. He was a philosopher. He was a big picture thinker. And he popularized the idea that we are living on a spaceship called Earth. He also pointed out that talking about going into space, that's really not an accurate phrase. How can you go where you already are? The earth is in space, isn't it? And it's always been in space and we have always been in space and we will never be anywhere else. So we fall into this language of going into space and we're already there. I would love to have Bucky come speak to this class. I would love to hear how he would design for human beings to live on Mars. He would have thought about it in a much larger context than just buildings or habitations. I think he would have thought about it in terms of what I call preparing to become Homo spatians. Homo spatians is an imagined future in which humans are far more adapted to living off the planet than we are today. Some people have even talked about speciation where we actually become a different species uh, than we are, something other than Homo sapiens. I think Bucky would have asked as a philosopher, well, what does it mean to become a multi-planet species? Whatever it means, humans are going to Mars. There's just no question about that in my mind. 
it isn't if, but when. Um, we've already got a number of our uh, friends, the robots, the rovers are on Mars. You know, when you ask, is there life on Mars? Well, if you think robots are living things, there is life on Mars. Um, there definitely are sentient beings on Mars. And in a way, mentally, we're on Mars uh, because we can see Mars up close. We've got, we've got uh, spacecraft circling Mars. We've got the rovers on Mars. We're, we're very, very involved in Mars even though we're not there physically. But why do we wanna do this? Why do we wanna go there? You know, it seems like if you look at the COVID situation, human beings react as a species to threats or opportunities. So if we're severely threatened, we can get it together to do an enormous amount. Like the United States, felt incredibly threatened by the Soviet Union back in the 60s because the Soviet Union seemed to be ahead of us in space exploration. President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him home safely within the decade. We had no idea how to do that. We had barely put a human being into a, a suborbital hop. And yet, because there was a threat, NASA got it together and did what President Kennedy said we should do. And he said something really interesting that you don't hear politicians say today. And he had quite a Boston accent, which is where I live. And he said, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We do these things because it's hard. Going to Mars is hard. And for many people, that's an opportunity. Elon Musk says, and this is plan B, Elon Musk says we better get to Mars because we're sitting here, we're very vulnerable to an extinction event. And a lot of people are looking at uh, COVID and saying, yeah, we could have an extinction event. So we might wanna go because there's a threat. NationalGeographic.com had a great story on the possibility that humans, maybe 20% of the population, carry an exploration gene. This is a genetic predisposition to risk-taking. And if the culture in which these human beings live supports exploration, they may make up all kinds of reasons why they want to do it, but mostly it's a genetic predisposition. We also have a mysterious fascination with Mars. Humans have been fascinated with Mars for many years and Robert Goddard, who did his work about a hundred, well, about 50 miles from where I live, reportedly he was sitting in a cherry tree one night and he had a vision of Mars and it, profoundly changed him and he invented the liquid fuel rocket out of that vision of Mars. And then of course there are scientists who are curious. They want to know all they can about Mars. They, they, it's a fascinating place for scientists. That's why all those robots are there. There may be financial reward. I mean, Elon Musk is a business person. He must have some idea that he can make money taking people to Mars. If he doesn't, other business people may decide, I can make money creating human settlements there. You know, some people just want to be on the frontier. They want to be on the leading edge. Um, there was a project that fell apart recently uh, about putting a, a settlement on Mars. It was gonna be a one-way trip. And I, I talked to the co-founder of that and I said, I would go, but I have a family, I wanna get back home. I, I'd love to go to Mars, but I'm not gonna stay there. And I said, I think you're losing people by doing this. He said, you know, many of the people, Frank, who have signed up told me they wouldn't sign up if it was two-way. They don't want a safety net. 
They don't want a way home. They want to create a new civilization on Mars. They want to be Solarians, as I call them. I, I say there are two different types of people right now. Terrans want to stay on the Earth, save the Earth, make it a better place. And, and that's an important function. We cannot abandon the Earth. We can't. We'll just become galactic nomads. We've got to keep the home planet. But Solarians, as I call them, whether they know why they want to do it or not, they want to be out there. They want to be on the frontier. They want to start new settlements. What about storytelling? Well, we've told a lot of stories in the past about Mars, especially in the West. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs is the person who invented Tarzan, King of the Jungle. He wrote about people living on Mars. C.S. Lewis, a don at Oxford and Cambridge, wrote a science fiction trilogy. Uh, it was pretty good for something written in the 1930s, and he wrote a lot about people going to Mars. H.G. Wells wrote about War of the Worlds, an invasion of the Earth by Mars. Does anybody know the aliens invaded Earth from Mars? And they were just wreaking havoc on the Earth. They had incredible technology and killing machines, but they, they didn't succeed in taking over the Earth. Anybody know why? Anybody know that story? Is this a sci-fi story or are you just in facts and we're just not aware of this? <laughs> it's a science fiction story. <laughs> okay. Wait, is this War of the Worlds? This? Is this War huh? of the Worlds, Frank? Is this about War of the Worlds? Yeah. Why did the Martians fail to take over the Earth? Man, it's been a while since I've seen it. I think it was, um, I want to say it was something music related. Um, no. Uh, no, am I off? Okay, I don't remember. Anybody know? Sarah, you know? Okay, viruses. Viruses killed them because they had no immunity to Earth viruses. Huh. <laughs> so they just all started dying, you know? They had just about taken over and then they all died. So yeah, viruses can be your friend or your enemy, right? Uh, most recently, Kim Stanley Robinson wrote a trilogy called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, or I don't know if I have the order right, but anyway, this is a brilliant science fiction story. You all ought to read at least part of it. This guy knows a lot about Mars. He's got a lot of scientific detail, but he imagines human settlements, how they evolve, how they develop. And in particular, he talks about the conflict between those who want to be Martians, they want to adapt to Mars, and those who want to terraform Mars. And I think he prefigures a really significant question. Uh, recently, Andy Weir wrote a highly praised book called The Martian, which became a film and on and on. This storytelling is very, very important. What stories will the future Earthlings and Martians tell about what we do on Mars? I've pointed out that for many years in the United States, Columbus was a hero. Columbus discovered America, which of course he did not, but he, he kind of stumbled onto America. But, you know, he was a great explorer. If he hadn't come here, we wouldn't have had the United States and all of that. And we had Columbus Day. And now many uh, cities and towns have abandoned Columbus Day. We don't have Columbus Day. Even Columbus, Ohio, named after Columbus, has Indigenous Peoples Day. Why is that? Did, did Columbus do something terrible last year? No, Columbus has been dead for 500 years. He hasn't done anything. Our consciousness has changed because he was also a great exploiter. And his coming here and Europeans coming to this continent led to great deprivation for the indigenous people. So the story has changed.
500 years from now, what stories will be told about humans on Mars? Will humans be heroes or villains? A lot depends on classes like this and how we approach Mars, what we think of Mars, what is our philosophy about Mars? One of the things I really got into in writing my book is that if you ask for why we explore the universe, a lot of it is our change in consciousness. The overview effect is a realization that the Earth is a whole system and we're a part of it. We see its wholeness, its interconnectedness. I then defined another thing I found out in interviewing astronauts, which is what I call the Copernican perspective. This is an understanding that the solar system is yet a larger system, and we're part of that. And then the universal insight, the universe is a whole system, and we're a part of that. A lot of people have asked me, is there a Mars effect? Will be there some kind of change in consciousness when we go to Mars? Yeah, but I don't think it'll be like the overview effect. I think it'll be more like the Copernican perspective because uh, there's a philosopher of space named Nick Nielsen who has pointed out, we can never have the shock that astronauts felt when they left the surface and looked back at the earth. Looking back at the earth, once you've been born on the surface of the earth is extraordinary. But we have seen Mars from a distance all along. Maybe people born on Mars will feel that way if they leave the planet. But for Earthlings, seeing Mars as a whole system interconnected and interwoven, that's, that's what we see already. And Nick calls it the home world effect. So it will be different. I'll talk more about this philosophical shift of the Copernican perspective. But let me give you a little more grounding in the overview effect. Um, one of the things we need to understand about space exploration is there are a lot of unintended consequences. The first astronaut I interviewed for my book was Joe Allen. And he said, with all the arguments pro and con for going to the moon, no one suggested that we should do it to look at the Earth. But that may, in fact, be the most important reason. I don't think there's any question it was the most important reason because going to the moon gave us a view of the entire planet, which you don't get from orbit. It's very different to go to the moon as opposed to being in low earth orbit because the moon is uh, much farther away. And when you're in low earth orbit, the earth fills your field of vision. It's Anybody know, can somebody tell me how far away the International Space Station is? I knew Martin was coming forward. <laughs> well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if other people speak mm -hmm. up or so I'll give them a shout. Yeah, I, it doesn't have to be, uh, it can be the students. Students know where the International Space Station is? Because it was um, uh, between, between 40 and 100, I don't exactly remember. Somebody have a hand up, I can't see. Somebody wrote uh, 400, what was that? I didn't see that, uh, 400 kilometers. Pretty good. It's about 200 miles from the surface, right? Anybody know how far away the moon is? A lot farther. <laughs> a lot farther. Let's leave it at that. My point is the Earth and, you know, the International Space Station, you're very close when you're in orbit. When you go to the moon and you look back, you can see the entire planet against the backdrop of the universe. So going to the moon was really, really important. Going to Mars, you're going to be a lot further away, aren't you? So the overview effect is a cognitive shift that's been reported by astronauts and cosmonauts that changes their perspective on themselves, on our planet, and on our future. It's just the beginning, though, of the changes in consciousness that humans will have as we move further away from the surface of the Earth. 
Now, what happens when astronauts leave the planet? I want to show you this uh, little video. This is an astronaut that I interviewed at Johnson Space Center in June of last year. I interviewed a total of 10 astronauts, and these interviews became the basis for an incredible uh, series that NASA is doing called Down to Earth. Astronauts see no borders or boundaries are present on the planet. It's a beautiful place. And they say, we're all in this together, aren't we? Which is what everybody is saying now, as we are threatened by the virus. But the, you know, the astronauts have been trying to tell us this all along. Let me see if I can make this uh, video run for you. I had looked at pictures on social media and pictures in NASA archives of the Earth so many times, I actually started to get worried. What if I get up there and it's just like the pictures? I mean, uh, that's going to be weird if, if that's the thing where I'm like, oh, it looks just like the pictures. I'm ready to go home now. And then on the Soyuz, my launch vehicle launched with the Russians. And uh, on my Soyuz, when I first got a chance to look out my little window, which is about right here at the Earth, uh, there's something about looking out a round window at the curvature of the Earth that makes it just more pronounced and, and really makes it have a huge impact. I just had this feeling like I was way up high looking down and we were over the ocean and the blues that I saw, it was, I mean, it was ridiculous. I, I'd never imagined in my entire life getting to see something that beautiful. It was so foreign for the human mind to look at that, to see that total black of space, to see the earth highlighted that way. And then I got to see a sunset. I had one piece of paper that had a picture of my kids on it and a few of my flight data file uh, burn times on it. But I, I just took a pencil and I drew like 15 curved lines and I just wrote light blue, darker blue, pink, purple, dark purple, dark, dark purple, all the way down to the surface of the earth at sunset because the scale of looking at a sun refracting through the atmosphere, it blew me away and no picture captures that. There's no high enough dynamic range of a photo to capture what the human can see. So that first look outside completely sidelined me. I had a GoPro and I made a recording to my brother of no matter how much it costs in, in the future, come do this. You have to come do this. I mean, it's amazing. Over my six months in space, getting to look at the Earth every single day, it shows you something different. Every day it shows you that it's alive, it's a being just like we are. We're guests on this planet. Um, and it is, it's our mother, it's our father, it's our starship cruising around the sun in the middle of the solar system. There was never a moment that I looked out the window and didn't immediately grab a camera to take a picture of something that our planet was doing. It always surprised me, it's always been useful. I'm a pilot, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a poet, but certainly when you're in low Earth orbit, looking down at the Earth, it doesn't matter if you're a physicist, a school teacher, uh, a stay-at-home parent, um, or maybe you just backpack for your whole life. If you look out, you're gonna have a magical experience in your own way for certain. Okay. Wow, I just got goosebumps listening and watching that. <laughs> I, get, I get goosebumps every time I hear that. So oh. think about this. Oh my goodness, what's that? Sorry, give me a moment. Hello. Hi, what's up? I'm giving my presentation to the students. Do you need me? Okay. I'll be down shortly. Okay. Sorry. Um, Is everything yeah. okay? You need to... Yeah. Yeah. If I have to take a break, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, yeah, please, 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 if you're the freedom, if you have to look after your wife or, you know, please, please uh, take a break if you need to. We can definitely take a, take a break. Could we take, could we take a quick break now? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Let's yeah. do that. I'll come back. Okay. Actually, I have something to share with the students while you're away as well. So, so I, I can mobilize their time. All right. Great. Yeah. Hey Frank, hope she's okay. I'm sure I'm sure she is. I'll just check. Thank right. you. See you in a few minutes. 
Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a good time to actually, uh, we can start to look at the question and start to organize them. Uh, I have shared in the, uh, in the chat uh, a link to the, to, the, to the questions. So I'm gonna share it again. Some really great questions I was just reading as they were coming in. So as you can see, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to organize them by categories. So some question about specifically the overview effect. And you see, I put a hashtag at the beginning. So what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is to, um, I try to simplify a question to really get to the points. And you can create categories and you can create uh, just so that to make sure that we ask the best uh, question possible in, in the time that we have with him, which is very, very privileged. So if you can, uh, if you can work for the few minutes, that, that's a good chance to do that. Very curious about that uh, that question as well about astronauts whether they've changed. Um, I think Erica asked that whether their lifestyle changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was watching a video by Chris Hatfield the other day um, where he talks about the overview effect, and he was saying, yeah, he he lives a very different lifestyle after. after uh, spending like a year in space or, or however long he was there, I think about a year. Oh, one really? Things, in what uh, way? One of the things he said is um, he, he can't, uh, I, I, think, I think it was Chris Hadfield, he said, you know, he can't bear to eat meat anymore. Yeah. Um, so you have this kind of moral change of perspective, you know. Mm. So, for example, I feel like in using the overview effect to change awareness of everyday people, uh, Oscar and Yui, I think you, in a sense, asking the same question, right? You are you are saying like, how can we um, how can we use the overview effect without having going to space, right? Like how to affect change in people's behavior? I, I feel that we can uh, we can kind of combine a question: uh, how can we uh, simulate? the overview effect um, for earthlings. Um, so to change their behavior. Would that be fair to say that uh, that's a summary of your, of your question? Or would you, would you phrase it differently? So the question I'm going to uh, underline in yellow, which I think is like a synthesis yeah, I mean, they, I'm sure he know he can say more about it than me, but uh, I know there's been some VR studies. Oh, uh, Frank is VR back. Is he, is he back? Yes. I'm back. Frank, is, is your wife okay? Yep. Do you want me to answer some questions or keep going? What would be good? I think we can keep going and uh, resume and uh, pick up where you, where you, where you left. Okay. Well, you'll need to share this. Uh, oh, no. Do we have it? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. 
All right. So just imagine this. You heard Reed Wiseman, the astronaut, talk about this beautiful planet. Um, are you seeing the screen okay? Uh, no, I think it's on the wrong tab. Or is it just me? Uh, no, no, I can't see it either. I think you need to change your PowerPoint to your Google Slides. I Hold can on. see a zoom. The other tab? Zoom screen. Hold on. Let me start again. There we go. Yep. We good? Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. I want you to imagine what Reed Wiseman was talking about. He said, it's a living being like us, the Earth. It's our mother. It's our father. It's our spaceship. I want you to imagine the first settlers leaving the planet. There's probably going to be a couple of orbits of the Earth. You know, we're not quite sure all the ways we're going to get to Mars. Just imagine seeing that sight, the overview effect, and then the spacecraft going to Mars accelerates. And over time, as you're looking out the window of the spacecraft, the Earth begins to disappear from sight. How do you think you might feel about that? You know, I don't know if you've ever gone on an ocean trip where you got on a, on a, on a, ocean liner and watched your home country slowly disappear as you moved into the unknown. So that's going to be significant. And it's part of, I think, how people are going to have to adapt to living on Mars, simply missing the Earth, this beautiful planet. So let's move on to the Copernican perspective, which is more like what Martians are going to experience. And when the Voyager spacecraft left the planet, was moving to the edge of the solar system, the great astronomer Carl Sagan asked for the camera to be turned around and a picture to be taken uh, from a distance somewhere around, I believe, Neptune or uh, Saturn. I'm not sure where it was. But Carl Sagan coined the term pale blue dot. And I'm just going to play his very brief meditation on the pale blue dot. And this is really a good evocation of what I call Copernican perspective. The understanding that the Earth is a whole system. When we're close to it, it seems large. But the further out into the solar system we move, the smaller we realize that it is. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager. Every hero and coward. Every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant. Every young couple in love. Every mother and father. Hopeful child. Inventor and explorer. Every teacher of morals. Every corrupt politician. Every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. 
how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Hey, that, that's always a good one to uh, see and hear again, Frank. <laughs> Listen. Yeah, uh, I never get tired of that. And you noticed he pointed out, he, he raised the question, can we actually settle on another planet? Visit, yes. Settle, no. But I think humanity's next step really is to move from living in a finite uh, system to moving into an infinite frontier. Um, it's from playing a finite game to playing an infinite game, it is migration into the solar system. Now, Elon Musk talks about colonizing Mars. I don't like that phrase. There are a lot of people on this planet who've been colonized and they don't feel good about, let's go colonize other planets. Settlement is better. Habitation, create communities, whatever you wanna say. Um, that's another story changing the language we use as we go to Mars, but I, I do not want to colonize Mars. Um, maybe, Zara, you're, you're muted, but you seem to have something to say. Sorry, I do, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to add, I feel so strongly about this and nobody really thinks about it because to me, colonization, there's just a whole, such a negative connotation with you know, slavery, like there's just so much negativity there. And I just hate the use of that word, but yeah, it's- I'm, I, I'm, on, a, I'm on a mission to stop using that term uh, yeah. and to say language matters, how we, how we talk about it matters. Yeah. But anyway, I will think about it. Yeah, of course. But we're going to move from being a multi species planet, which is what the Earth is, to being a multi planet species. It's a huge enterprise. However, I do want to leave all of you as designers with the major challenges. It's not going to be easy. As President Kennedy said, it's going to be hard to do. Um, there are physical challenges, psychological, legal, ethical, many, many challenges. How can design make the difference? What technology is going to allow humans to adapt to a different environment? That's what you're working on. You've got to think like a Martian. Um, I just interviewed, one of the astronauts I interviewed for the Down to Earth series told me about how people for the International Space Station had built a desk on which to put a computer when you're working on the International Space Station. That is Earth thinking. <laughs> what he found when he was on the International Space Station, you don't need a desk. You can float and type, you can hold it and type. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but his point was, the people who had done to the design were thinking about Earth and gravity, which is a constant. Uh, the, gra the gravity on Mars is far, far different from here, far less. Uh, 
there are many, many conditions there that are going to change how you design for them. So some of the issues to think about, social issues, who gets to go? Do I get to go? Do you get to go? I don't know how many people are in this meeting, but would 10% of us get to go? Would 20% get to go? What about physical? Let's face it, we're designed for Earth. We evolved on Earth. We're not designed to live on Mars. Mars would be happy to kill all of us, you know? Um, it, it may want to. We may look like invaders. We may look like viruses. Uh, Mars may just take us out. What about psychological? What is it like when the Earth is no longer in sight? Ethical, what if we find life on Mars? Should we terraform Mars? What if the legal issues, is it even legal to create a settlement on Mars? Who's gonna enforce breaking the law on Mars? Take a long time to get a spaceship from Earth to Mars if somebody goes into rebellion. I have predicted many times it won't be long before the Martians declare independence from Earth. They're not going to stand for being told what to do uh, by Earthlings, for sure. So who's going to decide who goes? Elon Musk? The government? The Chinese government? The American government? The United Nations? Will the people who go to Mars represent the Earth? Or will it be people who can pay Elon the freight? How do we decide that? And then how do you design for the different choices? Physical, again, low gravity, high radiation, a lot of situations there where actually most of the advanced thinking says we're gonna be living underground because Mars does not have the ability to protect us from high levels of radiation like the Earth does. One of the things that astronauts talk about is how thin the Earth's atmosphere looks from orbit or the moon. And yet, if it weren't there, we'd all be dead. Um, and Mars has a very thin atmosphere and no magnetic, uh, no magnetic shield. Have you ever thought about growing food on Mars? What are you going to eat? Are we going to take all our food from here? I, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty easy to resupply the International Space Station every six months, or we could probably even support a moon settlement from Earth. Um, I have a student in my class at Kepler Space Institute, Rhonda Stevenson, who's working on this. And when you think about it, everything goes back to food, doesn't it? In the Martian, that, that novel, the guy learns how to grow potatoes on Mars. I'd get kind of tired of potatoes after a while. Um, what else can you grow there? Nick Canis is a psychiatrist who's done work on the Earth out of sight phenomenon um, and the psychological impact. I'm not going to play this entire little clip, but I want to just show you this. This is the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. So that is, that is, if you were living on Mars, that's what the Earth looks like from the surface. And very similar, if you go out when Mars is close, look in the sky, you'll see Mars as a point of light. With a telescope, you can see some features. Martians, who may be starting to get homesick for Earth, they can't go out and look and see the Earth as a distinguishable feature with continents and oceans. 
We don't know if that'll have an effect. Now, the first people born on Mars probably won't care, you know. They, they may start to just not have any particular issues with Earth, and they may start to think of themselves as Martians. And speaking of storytelling, think of the stories they'll write about Earthlings. Earthlings may turn into uh, very interesting and uh, scary species if you're a Martian. We don't know. War of the Worlds might be written the other way, where the Earthlings invade Mars. That'd be a great story. This is an issue that I think is central, terraforming. Uh, modifying Mars to make it more appropriate to humans. Carl Sagan said, if there is life on Mars, I believe we should do nothing with Mars. Mars then belongs to the Martians, even if they're only microbes. I don't think Elon Musk agrees. He said, what I want to do is make Mars seem possible, make it seem as if it's something we can do in our lifetimes and that you can go. So what do we do if we find microbes on Mars? Big question. Um, do we want to make Mars like Earth? It'll be more compatible with our, us. But I mean, I want you to think about as humans migrate out into the galaxy, do we just want to turn every world into another Earth? Do we want a Walmart everywhere? Do we want malls everywhere? Do we just want to have it be easy for us to live there? Or wouldn't it be interesting if we adapted? What if when Europeans came to North and South America and met the indigenous people, they turned to each other and said, these guys know how to live here. Why don't we live the way they do? But the European settlers didn't do that. They tried to change the environment to fit what they had in England and Spain, and, and they tried to change the people to live like they did. What about legal issues? The Outer Space Treaty was signed by almost every nation in the world in 1967. It makes it very clear China cannot own Mars. The United States cannot own Mars. National sovereignty cannot happen on the moon or Mars. However, the language is very vague about private property. Mars could be like Antarctica, where everyone who goes there goes there for research and nobody owns anything and there's no ownership. On the other hand, what if people want to go own part of Mars? That's going to affect what we design, how we design. So what we need, I'm, I'm getting close to the end here, what we need is a philosophy of space exploration. One of the great storytellers of all time was Gene Roddenberry. He, he created Star Trek. And he told stories about the future when humanity as a united species has burst out into the galaxy. We have Star Drive. Uh, we have warp drive. Uh, we actually are cooperating with other species and we're out there exploring the universe. And we have this prime directive. And Jean-Luc Picard, one of the captains of the Enterprise said, it is not only a, a regulation, it is a philosophy. And the prime directive was non-interference in the evolution of other species. So it was all about exploration, not about exploitation. And underlying everything that we're talking about is what will be the balance of exploration and exploitation as we move out into the solar system? Now, I have written another book uh, called The Cosma Hypothesis. My insight that led to that book is that all justifications of space exploration that I've seen are about benefits to humanity. May we ask the question, how do we benefit the universe? I believe we have an ecological purpose in the universe 
And a new prime directive is give more to the universe than you take, or at least balance it out. What can we give to Mars? What can Mars ask of us? Have you ever asked yourself if a planet has rights? The astronaut said the Earth is a living being like us. If it's a living being, does the Earth have rights? A lot of people think the Earth has rights. What if we accept that the Earth has rights and Mars has no rights? If Mars has no rights, we can terraform it, we can do anything we want. If it has rights, we can't. And I know this kind of thinking affects design. You know, some architects of the hero school think you just build an incredible building. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the environment. Other architects try to build the, the built environment to fit into the natural environment. Two different philosophies, two different kinds of buildings. Your philosophy, our philosophy on Mars is going to affect design. I could go on and on, but you would all fall asleep eventually. Um, I want to end by just saying, first of all, thanks for letting me think about this. Whenever I try to teach anything, I have to learn to teach. And in conclusion, I'd say, Humans have achieved an overview of our planet. It's probably the most important evolutionary step we've taken. It's only been part of us for the last 50 or 60 years. Now we're taking the next step, which is to leave the planet. How are we going to write this story? Everyone on Earth can join in this great adventure. Everybody should think about it. Um, just a quick anecdote. I was driving through Boston at one point. Remember, we used, to, we used to be able to drive around and go places. We could go places and do things. Back in the day, in the, in the dark ages, when I could drive into Boston, I was in a traffic jam, which we don't have anymore, thank goodness. And the car in front of me, I was kind of getting all upset. I was in a hurry. I looked at the bumper sticker on, on the car in front of me, and it said, peace on Mars, dot, dot, dot just thinking ahead. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to think ahead. Design can be a, a really critical influence. Are we going to change Mars? Is Mars going to change us? Is it a mixture of both? I think that's what your course is all about. I think it's great that this course has been created, and I think it's going to stretch your brains uh, in a good way. And uh, I'm glad I've been a part of it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was really, uh, that was really amazing. Uh, I like Thank the, all the so inspiring. I like all the students to, um, to actually show their faces so that we are not in a lonely uh, place. So <laughs> please uh, share your faces and, and show that you actually exist as a human being. That'd be very helpful. Thanks for very the thought. Yeah, we might have some Martians here. We better uh, <laughs> just confirm we all are human. Great. Um, How are you with time, Frank? Do you have a bit of time to go over some questions that the guys wrote? Yeah, I can, I can answer a few questions, then I'll have to head out. But just yeah, let us know. Questions. Go ahead. So uh, we, uh, we put, um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and, and then show you the, the question that we have uh, prepared. Uh, they are here. So, um, uh, so we tried to synthesize some of the questions because a lot of them were, were similar. Uh, um, we have a, we have quite a, we have many questions. So maybe you, uh, if you keep your answer uh, answer quite short, then I guess we can cover a lot of grounds. But of course, feel as as also you want to manage your own time. Okay. So the first question is: um, uh, Are you a Terrian or you a Salarian? And uh, if given the opportunity to go right now. Um, would you go and, or would you not go and why? If I had, well, let me answer the question. I really do believe that there is another category, even though I came up with these categories, I don't think they're quite complete. I think there is a hybrid of Terran and Solarian 
which is someone who does want to leave the planet, but also save the earth. Uh, I don't have a name for that, but, um, you know, there is a person with a totally different philosophy from Elon Musk, and that's Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff Bezos says we have to leave the earth to save it because he says there are too many, well, there's not too many people on earth, but the number of people on earth, given our current civilization, it's beyond the carrying capacity of the earth. So he imagines returning the earth to a more natural state as more people leave and as we take certain industries with us. So I do believe there is another category that I haven't defined yet. And I think I'm in that category. Um, mm -hmm. Given the opportunity, would I go? Absolutely. Um, I, I think I have that explorer gene. I have been pointing my entire life toward this opportunity and I definitely have plans to experience the overview effect. Um, as I said before, I would go to Mars. Um, I, I would like a return trip though. <laughs> I would like to be able to come back. So given, given the choice, that would be more difficult. But going into orbit, going to the moon, yes, absolutely. And I think- Frank. Frank, have yeah, you ahead. signed up with, uh, have you applied for um, Space for Humanity to go, you know, as a citizen astronaut with, with those guys? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, I'm on the board of advisors for Space for Humanity. Right. And when I first uh, talked to Dylan Taylor, who's the founder, I got the very strong impression that, um, you know, it was for people who otherwise would not have an opportunity to go. Right, right, okay. However, as a member of the Board of Advisors, I was asked by Rachel to go ahead and take the test. So I actually have applied. Okay, right. But I don't think I'll, I'll be able to go uh, with Space for Humanity. I think I'm going to have to have a GoFundMe uh, site. <laughs> Stay tuned. Sure. Uh, the other question, the next one is from Fergal. Uh, Fergal, do you want to say your own question, maybe rephrase it? Yeah, yeah. So my question for you is that is that your speech reminds me of the quote, history is, is written by the victors. Do you think that we have the moral right to colonize Mars? Will harvesting natural resources for survival be ethical on Mars? Will we be negatively perceived like Columbus? Fergal, that's a lot of questions and they're really good questions. Um, first of all, I would, I would want to eliminate the term colonize. Um, I do believe we have the right to settle on Mars, to live on Mars. Um, I, I think that the key question for me in developing a new philosophy is I don't think humans are going to go out into the solar system without some exploitation, that is some benefit for humanity. What I have, what I have argued for is a balance between exploration and exploitation. And I believe if we have that balance and if we practice it, we may escape being negatively perceived like Columbus. But I think it's going to take a lot of thinking and I don't see it present yet in plans for expansion into the solar system. So incidentally, um, I have created a new organization called the Human Space Program and we are working on these issues. Uh, our goal is to create a comprehensive, sustainable and inclusive blueprint for exploring and developing the solar system. I don't really have time to tell you all about it, but it is designed to deal with this problem. And I should say, uh, I'll, I'll definitely, first of all, if I don't get to all the questions, I'll try to answer them and, and send the answers back. But also, if anybody wants to get in touch with me about any of these issues, I'd be happy to talk to you. And uh, uh, Cesar and uh, Martin and Zara have my contact information. Thank you for answering my question. 
I'm not sure it was a complete answer, but I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's a bit of a question that follows in the footstep or follows on, on this one, is that a lot of people know you for the overview effects. Uh, you introduced the Cosmo hypothesis, uh, but it's a lesser or lesser known uh, idea. Uh, why are there other ideas that, you know, as a writer, uh, as a philosopher, you have many, many ideas and sometimes people know you for one idea, but you have so many more. Do you think that you have uh, even more important ideas uh, that are not as popular, but you think yourself in your heart, you know that they're the most important ideas and contribution. Maybe they will be recognized you know, much later. They're not understood today, perhaps. Mm. First of all, I think we have to recognize that the first edition of my book, The Overview Effect, came out in 1987. And um, it's kind of you to say that I'm famous for the overview effect, but it took 35 years to become famous. Uh, it took a long time. And uh, in the beginning, I really felt like the idea had not taken root at all. So I think, first of all, it takes time. Secondly, I think that the Cosmo Hypothesis book has only been out for a year, and I think it'll take time for it to penetrate. And also, right now, it seems, I think, difficult for people to understand how humans, being on this little pale blue dot, how can we give anything to this vast universe, right? It's just so huge. And yet we're evolving and we're part of the universe. So our evolution helps the universe to evolve. And, you know, not so long ago, we had the same question about the earth. We just looked at the earth as this enormous place that we could exploit and we could do anything we wanted to do here on the earth. And slowly but surely we have begun to see we need to balance exploitation and exploration on this one planet. So I do believe the Cosmo hypothesis will eventually become as well known as the overview effect. But I think it'll take time. And thank you, Cesar, for saying that I have a lot of other bigger ideas because I, I do really. And uh, sometimes I wish people would read the entire book and kind of get below the surface because for example, there's a lot of systems thinking in the book that is almost never mentioned. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I hope that people will um, begin to understand everything that I've written about and not just one, one thing. But I'm, I'm tremendously grateful that I had one idea that people understand. So <laughs> I'm not complaining. Pressure. Um, I would let uh, the, the students uh, ask the question they want. We have several questions about the review effect in particular. Um, so either Anson, Tanya, Erica, Nomi, uh, whoever feels the, the most burning desire to ask a question, please go ahead. Which one shall we tackle? The Should I answer the one in yellow? Uh, yeah, which, whichever. There's a student that was starting to step in. Guys, do any of you want to ask a question in person? Okay, maybe we should just read it. Then we can uh, take the yellow one. The yellow one is an attempt to synthesize the, uh, the different questions beneath it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The yellow, the, the one outlined in yellow is a good question. Um, I've told this story many times, but it's worth telling. I interviewed Edgar Mitchell, who was an Apollo 14 astronaut, and he was the sixth person to walk on the moon. And he said, he asked me something like, what have you learned? Or what surprised you so far? Because I'd interviewed quite a few astronauts by then. And I said, well, I thought, I thought everybody would have the same reaction to seeing the Earth from a distance. But I have found that people react differently, or they had different experiences. And Edgar said, no, we all had the same experience, but each of us interprets it through our history, our, our mindset, our worldview. 
the astronauts are different. And so interpretation of the experience is different. So that's what I would say is that, yes, everybody has the same experience, but they react differently. And I, I have, um, I've compared this to any other experience, like you can go to church, I go to church, and there are times, you know, when I feel like I actually experience divine connection. And you can go to church and feel like you're bored, that, you know, the, the minister is giving a very boring sermon, and all you can think about is getting home to have lunch. So people react differently to the exact same experience. And um, what surprised me the most, I think, early in my research was I had not thought about the difference between Earth orbit and the moon. And I also talked about that with Edgar and he said, yeah, going to the moon gives you a more universal perspective. When you're close to the earth, that's your primary uh, primary interest or your primary reaction. Um, again, going back to Edgar Mitchell, he probably had the most dramatic change. And that's why I called his experience the universal insight. Edgar really seemed to have an experience of connection to the entire universe. And in that film overview, he talks about it and how he, when he came back, he went around and asked people, what happened? What happened to me? And somebody said, you experienced samadhi, which is a state of enlightenment. And um, so I think in some ways that is the most dramatic description. And he came back and he started the Institute of Noetic Sciences which is the study of consciousness, because he felt like he had a very new understanding of consciousness. And that goes back to what I said before, which is I believe the most important aspect of space exploration is changes in consciousness. Uh, there's a question about simulating the overview effect. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. So there is a lot of work going on now to simulate the overview effect through virtual reality. And I think that holds a, lo a lot of promise. Um, if we can fool the mind into thinking that you're actually in orbit, and I think we can do that, then without putting people into orbit, we could reach thousands, in fact, millions of people with the astronaut experience. I have said this, and I keep saying it, I believe experiencing the overview effect should be a human right. Why is that? The overview effect is is truth. When you see the earth from orbit, you realize that we're in space as a species. As long as you're on the surface, you don't have that experience. You have intellectual knowledge that we're in space, but not an experiential knowledge. Um, and it's like the COVID effect, as I call it, everybody on the earth is suddenly saying, we're all in this together. And that's because we're having an experience of that. And this is, what, this is what the astronauts have been saying, but it's out of their experience. So virtual reality can give you that experience. And uh, there's a group called Space VR, which has been working for a long time on giving people the experience through VR. And they're putting people into flotation tanks with the goggles on. And, uh, you know, that, that's reproducing weightlessness and, and the imagery. Uh, there's also uh, the, son, the son of an old friend of mine named Jeremy Nickel 
has an online ministry in virtual reality and every uh, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern time in America, uh, Jeremy does a meditation in which he takes you from the surface of the earth into orbit and you experience the overview effect. It's very powerful. Uh, you do need uh, you do need virtual reality headset to do it. But those are just a couple of examples. A lot of people are working on this because immediately people are seeing this is a great experience. Yeah, there you go. That's space VR, right? Um, people are saying this is an important experience. Wouldn't it be great if if thousands of people could have it? Because then we would have that consciousness that we need in order to tackle global problems. Frank, um, quick question on that. Do you think this is different to sort of the feeling you have when you, I mean, I'm sure you've been to the Grand Canyon. I've been there only once. And it was, that's the closest to the kind of feelings that, that astronauts describe when they see the earth, you know, from above. That, that, that's the closest I've probably had to that. It's like seeing the Grand Canyon. Do you, like, do you think those are kind of different or is it like a spectrum of uh, a similar experience of oneness and wholeness? Well, I think it's certainly similar in the sense that you experience awe and wonder when you see the Grand Canyon. And more than one astronaut used that mm -hmm. analogy. And they said, the difference between hearing about the Grand Canyon and seeing it is, is similar to hearing about seeing the Earth from orbit and experiencing it. And um, I think it's true. I, I did go to the Grand Canyon for the first time. And I would say this, I would say that um, it, it brings out the difference in going on a short trip into orbit, like two weeks on the space shuttle versus being on the International Space Station for six months or seven months. I didn't have much time at the Grand Canyon and I really longed to spend a week there and, and really get into the Grand Canyon. Um, so I think that it is a good analogy and I think there are other earthbound analogies. And I think the experience of time is very important. And that goes back to what it will be like to be on Mars because, or the moon, imagine being on the moon and the earth is always in the sky. It, it won't be extraordinary, it'll be ordinary. And that's really what I thought the overview effect would be when I started writing about it. I didn't think of it as extraordinary. I thought it would be ordinary that the earth would be in the sky. And I guess it'll be true for Martians too. Hmm. Yeah. Has anyone else been to the Grand Canyon here, by the way? Cesar, have you been there? No, I have not. I'd love to go. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's it it is. I mean, you know, words can't do it justice. It's it it is a very much a experiential thing. You have to be there and experience. It's it's incredible. Yeah. And that's another thing astronauts talk about is how hard it is to to um, communicate their experience. Words mm -hmm. don't do it justice. They often say that. How are we doing this time? Are you okay with the two or three more short questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Babisha? Uh, I was curious to as to how mental health concerns that are associated with the journey of space flight contrast with the benefit of the overview effect, especially as there's a lot of distress and fear associated with the settlement of Mars. Oh, very good question. Um, you know, I have, I have an easy, uh, I have an easy out on this because I've defined the overview effect as a positive experience. Um, so by definition, it's, it's the good aspect of spaceflight. Um, I think it's very reasonable to have concerns about mental health. Um, it's been interesting that astronauts have been speaking out quite a bit lately on isolation. 
if you think about it, astronauts are at a social distance from everyone on Earth. It's very similar to what we're all experiencing in that they are with a small group of people very far from the larger um, body of humanity. They are not able to go anywhere and do anything. As I discussed about Mars, if you're on the International Space Station, you can't just walk outside. You'd be dead in a minute. You have to put on a lot of protective gear and it's very dangerous to go outside. So, and you are essentially isolated. So what has happened so far is whether they're, and, and this is true of Chinese astronauts or Taikonauts too, um, you know, everyone who's gone so far for any extended period of time has been rigorously selected and, and selected to avoid the kinds of problems that you're bringing up. And so I believe that that's going to be a big issue when we start thinking about people going to Mars because the International Space Station is close to Earth. The moon is only three days away. Uh, you still feel pretty close to your home planet. If you go to Mars, there are a lot of issues there in addition to the Earth out of view. And one is just that even if they make provision for return trips to Earth, it's going to take a long time to get back. And so I think we're going to have to have that rigorous kind of selection process to make sure that the people who go to Mars are ready for it. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, Mars, what would you call it, analog efforts going on now. I don't know if you know about this, but they're, they're setting people up in very hostile environments on Earth, small groups of people. Um, when they go out of the habitat, they have to put on a spaceship, a spacesuit. So I think, you know, it's, it's going to have a lot to do with selecting people who are clearly going to be able to take the changes. And yet we are probably still going to make mistakes and uh, we're probably still going to have problems uh, when we go to Mars. Designers can think a lot about that. So for example, would it be good to have ability to return to the earth with virtual reality, you know? That's, that's a design solution for that psychological problem. Do we? Yeah. Uh, so how do you think we can, so you talked about the overview effect and the Copernican effect. And I think you also mentioned that if we have, if we go to Mars, a different effect together. So how do you think we could go about studying the effects of the influence of these effects on the human psyche? And how can we predict that? Like, how can we prepare ourselves for those uh, when we go to Mars? Well, I think you can, I think you can uh, create uh, I think you can create what, what I would guess I would call, it's more than questionnaires, but I think you could create ways of interrogating or talking with people to find out which kind of psychology they really have. In other words, are they really much more suited to live here on this planet or are they suited to live elsewhere? And would they be able to uh, function if they were actually uh, living permanently elsewhere. And I think you can also do simulations where you can find out how people react. So that's one of the things that we want to do with the human space program. We want to create uh, this plan for human space exploration and development 
but we also would like to simulate certain situations to see if our plan will work. Now, in another sense, though, it's a self-selection process, isn't it? I mean, there might be people who would love to go into orbit and experience the overview effect, but if given the opportunity, they wouldn't go to Mars. They would not be interested in that. So even though it sounds like they are solarians because they want to go into space, they really are not. They're really Terrans who want to see the Earth from a distance, but then come home. So I think that's, you know, that's the way we're going to do this is we're going to, first of all, have self-selection, people who apply uh, to, to go on these various uh, missions. And then we're going to have psychologists and others with knowledge of the human psyche testing as to whether people are really gonna be um, uh, adaptable to that change. Just wanted to add to that, and you think that probably be very like intense mental training programs. I can imagine as well, for, like people. So yeah, I guess related to the simulation. Um, I assume astronauts do a lot of that. Astronauts do a lot of that. Oh yeah, I mean astronauts run simulations constantly, and and they run simulations of really bad things happening to them so that they can just react when it happens. It's, hi, my name is Anson, and my question is about identity. And my question is, do you think that Martians will slowly grow into a more superior group of human? Because like the first group of Mars settlers are most likely to be our top scientists or engineers, like our top minds. And do you think this group of settlers will grow and slowly develop a new set of identity and unity through generations and might pose a threat back to Earth. And if you think this could happen, how can we prevent such a chaotic incident? Do you think it is a, like a design problem or a philosophy problem or even a politics problem? Like, what do you stand on this? Uh, I think that's a really good question, Anson. I think the reason I said that eventually Martians will declare their independence is that that's exactly what happened with the American Revolution in the sense that the people who came here initially considered themselves, I, I'll just talk about North America, not, not South America, but what became the United States originally was a group of colonies and they were called colonies. Um, and they considered themselves British citizens or English citizens. Um, initially, there was no interest in rebelling against the crown. They felt their rights as citizens were being abrogated by the king. And over time, there was a feeling that the people in England couldn't possibly understand the environment they were in here. And so there was a revolution. And bear in mind, probably half the people here didn't go along with the revolution. Uh, in fact, many of them uh, are the ancestors of Canadians because they fled, they fled north. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's already been a rebellion in outer space. Uh, there was a Skylab mission in the 70s where mission control was controlling almost every aspect of the three astronauts' existence. And the astronauts wanted a break. They wanted to have earth gazing time. They wanted to relax. And on July 4th, which was the date of the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, they told uh, mission control they were gonna take the day off. <laughs> and uh, this is often cited as the first rebellion in outer space. Uh, yeah, it's called the mutiny and so on. But again, mission control couldn't understand what the astronauts were going through and mission control wanted to get as much out of the mission as they could. 
So yes, I believe, and, and I think I have said before, this all depends on the model which with, with which we settle other planets. I have ad, advocated the human parenting model. As a human parent, you control the child for a certain period of time, and then you let go. If you don't let go, the child will eventually rebel against you. So I would like to see our settlements on Mars. From the very beginning, we will assume they will become independent. And I think that's going to be the best way to prevent war between Mars and Earth, is to just assume that they're going to become independent. Um, think of all the colonies on Earth that had to rebel against their colonial masters. Uh, they were set up with the idea that they would be colonies forever, weren't they? And yet people don't like that. Human beings don't like living that way. Now, will they be superior? I would say different. And they may become something different than human. They may become homo spatians. They will have their own identity. Uh, they probably, generation after generation, will feel less and less loyalty to Earth. So they will be different. And uh, again, peace on Mars, just thinking ahead. What can we do to avoid war between Mars and Earth? Well, it all starts with how we go about creating this new human system on Mars. Codependency, somebody mentioned, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking that now that's uh, supposed to be in a, a more, you know, integrative model and, you know, as we move away from calling colonists and uh, you know, calling them settlers and cohabiting, um, yeah. instead of having an independence mindset, you think they could have a codependent mindset because it, it, that, that it tends to be a lot more productive uh, and engage in relations of peace and cooperation uh, mm -hmm. as the plan, you know, with our differences. Yeah, and that's part of the idea behind a human space program. The human space program is a central project for all of humanity to occupy us for the next millennium and to create a form of unity uh, and, and to deal with some of these problems before they arise. Uh, Elian Lang, Matthew? Maybe one more Hi. question. So I really want to know, so since you know so much about space, like what is your view on extraterrestrial life in our universe? Well, uh, I'm fascinated with it. I actually wrote a book on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and I gave a lot of thought to the question of extra, extraterrestrial life. And I would say a couple of things. One is, that in writing the book about extraterrestrial life and intelligence, I started with belief in a philosophy of what's called um, um, principle of mediocrity, which Carl Sagan believed in, which was that the earth is not special or unique. That as Sagan said, there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of planets and surely somewhere out there, uh, there are Earth-like planets. But I came across another theory, which is the cosmic anthropic principle. And cosmic anthropic principle says, no, just because there are billions and billions of stars and planets doesn't mean that the unique situation that the Earth finds itself in is reproducible easily. And so there are two possibilities and both of them are amazingly important. One is that we are one of many species that have reached a certain level of intelligence. And the other is that we're alone in the way we exist. And part of the problem with uh, communicating with other species is that 
in order for there to be a meaningful communication, we need to be close to them in time and space. Because if they've been around a lot longer than we have, they may have no interest in us. We may be too far behind them. Uh, if they are much less advanced than us, they won't have the communications capabilities. If they're very far away, imagine we do find a civilization a thousand light years away and they send us a message and they say, hi, here we are. It takes a thousand years for us to say, hello, here we are. Another thousand years for them to reply. I mean, the communication uh, could stretch out so far that again, the two sides would lose interest in communicating. So I like to think there are other species out there. I like to think they're at a level of intelligence um, and that we will communicate with them. But I'm not as optimistic about that as I was when I first wrote my book about it. Ha Frank, Martin, uh, have you have you read the, the Cosmic Anthropic Principle, the book? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty dense, but it's uh, it's also quite convincing on, you know, it's like um, the guy, I mean, it's two physicists, basically, one astrophysicist and uh, the other guy is also some kind of, uh, he's a quantum physicist, I think. And the book is quite convincing in that we are the only living thing in the universe, yeah. basically. It's, it, yeah, so if... And, it's kind and of the other, yeah, the other side of the story. And as I said, either possibility is pretty amazing. And either possibility creates an enormous responsibility for humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. Either we're going to have to get along with other um, intelligences, and that's going to be a challenge, or we're all alone. It's us and the cosmos. Wow. And that, that makes, I mean, either way, it makes our survival and our evolution important, doesn't it? It, it gives us an importance that we need to take seriously. I think this is, um, this is a great way of, uh, of closing. We don't want to hold you more. You're already giving us a lot of your, of your time. We really appreciate it. Well, I think that we've taken up most of your time, and I apologize for oh, that. Oh, no, not at all. We, we, <laughs> we're going to have many more sessions, so um, we'll have yeah. a lot of time with the students. Thank you so much. I, on behalf of the class, I, I really would like to express our, our gratitude for, for your precious time and, and experience. It's been amazing to, to have you. Yeah, thanks well, for joining, Frank. Thanks, guys, for joining. Thank you, Frank. The pleasure you, is all Jeff. mine. I love, I love talking about these issues. I really do. We will share with you uh, the, uh, the illustration and the works that are done by the students. We don't want to take you know, too much of your other time, but we'll definitely share. So at least you will see the, um, the influence that you will have had on these uh, young minds. Um, and on the, 15th of, sorry, on the 15th of June, uh, there will be a combination, like a final exhibition. So we'll send you an invite. If you're available, it would be great to have you join as well, if you want to see the results. I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you Sorry, I interrupted you, Frank. You were saying something. No, I was just going to say uh, I enjoyed it very much. The pleasure is all mine, and I'd be delighted to come back and see what you've produced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Thank Frank. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot, everybody, for preparing the question. I think that was, uh, that was very, uh, very productive. Um, I will get, the, do, you, do you see you guys see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we only have 10 minutes, so I'll go very, very quickly. But uh, I, um, I wanted to, um, oh, I wanted to tell you uh, a bit of a background about why we're using sci-fi to develop these new products. And I wanted to give the example of a very good friend of mine, Sean Frain. So uh, this is my friend, Sean Frain. He's, uh, he's a pretty goofy character. Uh, he's uh, actually half American, half, uh, half Chinese. Uh, he did uh, work at a uh, study at MIT and Bachelor of Physics. And uh, he did, while he was studying there, he also did this program called the MIT D Lab, which is a, a lab focused on extreme affordability and developing technology. And I want to, to show you a bit of his career because I, uh, uh, oh, 
sorry, because I know him so closely and, and I think a lot of what he does is very relevant to, to, to us. So I, I'll tell you a few of the company that he started. So after graduating, he was really excited about wind power because he saw that uh, the the was... uh, wind power would be a great way to bring electricity to the poorest people. So he developed a new type of turbine, which is the first non-rotational turbine. So it's a turbine instead of spinning, it will vibrate. So it's a membrane, and when you pass a wind through it, you can see it's dancing with his hand, it's oscillating. Uh, you probably have heard about the Tacoma Bridge. This, there was a bridge in America that was kind of flimsy, and it was in a, in a valley, like many bridges are. And so the wind became tunnel between the mountains. And then the bridge uh, suffered what we call the flutter effect. It started to fluctuate and start to distort. And so he invented a system where you have a membrane and it vibrates the membrane. And there are two coils uh, on each end of the membrane. And so because of these coils, uh, you create electricity. And so uh, that was a, a groundbreaking uh, invention because that means you have no moving part. You don't have a gearbox. It's a very low cost uh, count of parts. And so you can actually uh, light up lights and uh, it's much, much cheaper than making wind turbine. The number of parts is so much lower and there's no maintenance. And also when there's too much wind, the membrane will just heat uh, the, the, the two boundaries so it doesn't break. So extremely low maintenance, great for uh, isolated environments. Uh, but what turns out is that he, he did very well with his company. And then uh, the Chinese government started to subsidize heavily the manufacturing of solar panels. So much so that he anticipated that at the rate that the cost of wind uh, versus the cost of solar was really being dropped for political reason. Uh, China was really uh, making solar very cheap on a global scale. And that was great. Uh, but on the other hand, it means that this wind business was going to be dwindling. And so he sold the company. And then he turned himself to solar. He said, okay, I want to bring electricity to the world poorest and most isolated people. How can I do that? And uh, he started another company which was buying uh, fragments of solar panel. So he would go into solar factories, uh, solar panel factories, and he would buy the waste material of solar panels. And then he would use the solar panel and then he invented a sort of a 3D printer that would take solar pieces and then pick and place them as electronic components. And you could make custom solar panels of any kind of shape and size. And so he manufactured a bunch of these machines and he delivered them in different islands um, locations. He actually set up a business in the Philippines and they started to electrify a very isolated island, starting with the most uh, critical low energy device like mobile phone, laptops, so you could actually power communication, enable people to do trade, uh, enable people to actually power computers in schools, so bring education in remote areas. And so they electrified um, a couple of a dozen of remote islands, but it proved that this business model was quite difficult to, to sustain. So again, as an entrepreneur, he uh, built the company uh, and then he sold the second company. So he was keep, uh, keep making money every step of the way. And this is when I met him. I met him when he was in the process of selling his second business. I met him on the train. And uh, I saw him and Alex, uh, and I saw that they were uh, like uh, transporting this huge suitcase uh, full of solar panels. And I saw their campaign. I saw them on the train and we, we talked. I volunteered for them and we became friends. Uh, he was based in Hong Kong. So he moved out of the Philippines to live in Hong Kong. And then he became a member of Makabay, which is the, the lab that I, that I run. And so him and we, so we had a lot of, as friends, we had a lot of goofy experiences. Uh, while he was in Makabay, he developed uh, with his experience in picking and placing solar panels, he developed a new way to 3D print images, which was completely novel at the time and still very novel. So what you see here are droplets of ink. He prints on layers and then he finds a, a liquid that has the exact same refraction index. So he uses knowledge of, of 3D printing solar panels to 3D reprint 3D images. And so he started to do medical imaging. So people brain scans and like uh, medical imaging and he started to sell those models. So instead of having a 2D uh, like x-ray, you could get a 3D, for example, body scan. And med uh, the doctors could actually see uh, like your, your thoracic, your, your like rib cage in 3D. You could see your cancer in 3D, which is much more important when you're gonna get the surgery. You wanna see exactly where it is. And so he started to develop this and he did sell you know, thousands of these kind of models for like hospitals. But eventually he realized, but this is not dynamic. How can I make this technology dynamic? How can I represent a living organism? 
And so he turned to uh, a technology that already existed, but he made it commercial. So he invented the first uh, like 3D dynamic commercial cubes. A lot of people are doing this online, uh, but they did the first one that you could actually really program and that you could uh, also have a, like a software to control every pixel. And so uh, within Makabe, they actually uh, manufacture thousands of those uh, 3D displays. So they're excited about it. They develop a whole kind of YouTube for 3D images and low res, like DJs around the world started to use it. Uh, people started to, to be excited about it, but then they were starting to get frustrated with the resolution. So they thought, uh, how can we make this, you, you know, they started to really hack it and use like different interface to draw in 3D, but they wanted, how can we make it a high resolution? And this is when their story really shifted. They were up to then, they were really talking to VCs and they are making maybe like a couple of hundreds of thousand US dollars. And then they turned to sci-fi. They started to hire sci-fi writer and then sci-fi illustrator to explain their vision with sci science fiction kind of language. And they did these kind of drawings. They said, what we want to do really is we want to create the, 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 the future of holograms. We want to have like a box. We don't want to have headsets. We don't want to have any kind of gear. We want to see a real image in 3D. We want to be high resolution. We want to be able to touch it, rotate it, change it. Uh, and they made uh, tens and tens of these kind of, uh, of sketches. And they would be to create that and then to simulate what the technology would look like in different environments, in a medical, in underwater exploration, uh, like for like uh, looking at babies, uh, like for heart surgery to see in 3D in real time. And uh, eventually they fundraise millions of dollars with the, with the VCs and they, they actually built it. Uh, but for them, it was absolutely necessary to use, um, to use sci-fi to actually bring uh, people in that, uh, in that reality. And so this is the product. This is like a holo this is a hologram, basically. You can make it in Unity, and then you can see in real time the 3D object. No need for glasses, nothing. You could just see this object in 3D. And it's still a little bit under the radar. You, I don't know if you have seen any of this, but the very first prototype of these were made of like low cost uh, projectors, laser projectors, and etching on uh, acrylic sheets and baby oil mix. And so what he does is that they mix a 4K images, they split it into multiple layers, and they create this like real projection. They, they basically create pixels in space. And so now they have a commercial product uh, that, you, that you can see. It's being sold in hospitals. Uh, it's being sold as entertainment. And you can go on the website and purchase it. So what I wanted to show you here is that is the same guy as an inventor, as a designer, went from a wind power company, sold it, shifted to a solar pocket factory, a solar printing technology. Then they used the knowledge they had in 3D printing solar panels, transferred it into 3D volumetric display, like uh, you know, printing 3D images. Then they moved it into uh, a 3D cube, low resolution. And now they have the first like, high resolution, holographic, customer uh, ready, holographic display. And it's the same group of people. But what is incredibly powerful here is that they have this mindset. One, it's entirely sci-fi driven. It's exactly what you're doing. What, I, what we're doing right now is a completely new way of doing, the, of, of doing design in, a, in this kind of conscious way. Uh, there was always a relationship between like sci-fi and design, but we use it as an actual method for you to learn. The second you can see is relentless prototyping. Uh, from having lived basically like night and day with these guys, they're working night and day in their labs. I can see what, what really uh, like set them from apart from the competition. They are relentlessly prototyping. They have an idea, even if it's sci-fi, they actually try to make it lo-fi first. You know, like when I talk about like low resolution display, high resolution display, that's exactly how like real technological uh, revolution happened. It's not the breakthrough. It, it appears a breakthrough to people from the outside, but from the inside, this is a, a relentless prototype. You, you keep making it. And then the third is that they're really good business mindset. They're so, this is an interesting technology, but it really has leg. It really has, it really responds to human needs. And they would not only prototype, but they would constantly go to hospitals, they would go to, uh, you know, to, to, to talk to artists, talk to really, like, really people who have brain damage, like really, really range, big range of people. So, uh, so I just wanted to tell you this story because I just want you to really understand that what we're doing is not some, you know, fringe uh, exper experience in like Mars, mind science, like this is an actual way of developing products of raising money from VCs, of reaching markets.
like what, I'm, what we're talking about, you know, like when you, when you stepped into this brief, you might think this is so futuristic and crazy. No, this is actually how people uh, build businesses, make real products, make money. So, um, so I, I just wanted to, to mention that because it's a story I, I, I know very, very well. Uh, do you have any questions before we go into, uh, into uh, the, next, the next phase? Do you have questions about my goofy friend, Sean Frank? <laughs> uh, how do you guys feel, Zara and Martin? Like, how do you feel you relate to such a, a company? Do you feel that's what do you think you have a very different approach? No, uh, no not at all. I, I think uh, I think it's spot on what you said. I mean, it's very iterative. Uh, you obviously don't come up with uh, with an idea and then suddenly all the pieces are there. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and it's very iterative like that. Yeah, I yeah, strongly agree with that. Um, and you know, you, you yeah, you can't you can't see that from the from the outside. Obviously, from the outside, you see and hear only whatever the business or the person decides to to talk about at any given time, right? And you don't see the, all the many details, the sweats yeah. and the tears. You just see the iPhone, and you think, ah, oh, cool. What feature does it have? And if one feature doesn't work very well, you're going to go on a forum. You're going to be mad about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Um. Oh, sorry, you want to you say something? No, no, I was just going to say that's a great point. I want to look into that in more detail as well. I haven't come across his work on this before. It's very yeah, it, looks, it looks really cool, yeah. Do you know who he raised from, just out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, I can, I can definitely tell you. So if you go on the website, uh, it's called the Looking uh, Gla uh, Glass Factory. Um, one of the, the main VC that kind of believed in the earliest is the FSV. Is based in Shenzhen. They have uh, the Hacks, which is the world's largest hardware accelerator. Well, hacks, in the world. Yeah, yeah, hacks. Uh, so sure. if you go, yeah. yeah. So if you go at the bottom, you can see uh, some of the the companies that have invested in them. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it might be in the about us section. And uh, I mean, th these guys are really cool. So they were in Next Bay. They were just three guys at the beginning. Uh, in like in 2015, there was Alex and and uh, Sean and and and, uh, and um, Alvin. And now yeah. they have raised several millions of dollars. Now they have an office in uh, Kuntong and they have another office in, uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, yeah, so they, they, they really are. Uh, so these are the investors, Foundry Group, LUX, and Cork. And oh, Lux, I love Lux them. They have some of the most yeah. amazing. The second one, Lux Capital. Oops, they, they've recently invested and led the acquisition of eventually Facebook. You know this brain computer interface com oh. company? Control labs? control labs control labs yeah so labs invested a large amount but they yeah they focus very much on a lot of these like future focus i think they're great so yeah so yeah so this this is a really really cool really cool company i wanted to to share the story um Thank you. i know we already reached the time but i want to take a few minutes to go at uh, let's say three uh three of the uh, ideas of the students and then like this we can give a bit of feedback right away uh, after this session, I will share with everybody as uh, I haven't received the, the but I'd like to have three volunteers uh, to come forward and then share uh, share their um, their illustration and then tell tell the story that they have uh, cook up, cooked up. So uh, who would be willing to to share their stories and share the illustration. So basically you share the illustration and then you tell the story you know, in a few sentences. If nobody volunteers, Hi, I'll um, share. Uh, wait. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Should I share my screen? Uh, yes, please. And so who are you working with, Carson? I work with Tanya. Tanya, and what's your time zone? Uh, my time zone is 240. 240. 2040. Yeah. Uh, wait a second. Uh, hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so for our design, uh, I made this poster 
based on this technology called smart dust. So we talked about how intrusive uh, inside the body devices might affect our lives as a somewhat like simulating back of the black death. Uh, the concept revolves around how there's this product called smart dust in which is made by many different companies, one of them being Hitachi. So it will basically go in your body like uh, dust but then it's somewhat like a doctor, so it will analyze parts of your body and it will fix it up. But the problem I think with this technology is that um, what if it gets to the wrong hand, such as people who are in control of your dust can actually affect your health. So in essence, they could actually just kill off everyone who has the dust in them, creating a large amount of death as they are the ones who control who lives and who dies. So uh, in this illustration, I showed the effect of it and how maybe the smart dust would just be in your body as if you don't have any control over your own health anymore. So, so uh, uh, how does it connect to like the, the, the mind? So it means that it's complete, it's not design, it's just the environment, or this is something that's designed by, by humans? Or this is a design that exists already, and I think uh, Tanya has a story that, that's based around design. Can you, can you walk us through the story or, um, and all the characters so we understand a bit like how you articulate the use of that d device, that smart dust? Carson, can you bring up the, the document, please? Okay. Um, I'm going to have to open it up from... Oh, there you go. So while they are preparing, uh, uh, can, you, can the next person willing to share prepare so we, you know, we save the time for the next person? Thank you. So for the for our story, we felt that um, it's quite dystopian by nature. So if you see the little small um, segment next to the image that Carson made, it's quite dystopian when you read it. Um, and for our story, it's uh, we decided to go for in the form of a first person view as a kid. And it's his personal recount. And basically, uh, we'll give you a chance to read it. But basically, um, it goes to show that these people who, that this child who was born on Mars um, cannot see the detriments that we would objectively be able to see. And instead that he has no idea how the government has so much power at this point in time. That's really cool. So it's kind of an innocence. So it's like a super being, but he doesn't understand how superior he is yet. No. That's a that's a really good starting point. Uh, Zera or so so the, or so is there any way that that this child is administered that dust? Is there somebody like an authority, a parent, or a company, or an institution that basically injects or? start to take control over that child actually uh, if you yeah. scroll down okay if you scroll down the very last part i'll read it but everyone in daddy's job is young daddy says that the government will always know what i'm up to so i shouldn't be a bad girl he says that they know when i'm eating junk food i don't believe him i know he's trying to scare me i asked daddy yesterday if people on earth will die soon because they're getting so old i asked daddy if we will ever die or get cancer Daddy told me that I will never get cancer because they will know before anything can get way too serious without him knowing. So that effectively just communicates the more dystopian side where these dust particles have entered our bodies and they can control whether or not we get sick or when we will survive or what happens in our bodies, like the doctor element. Um, but because it's, he's supposed to be one of the first children um, the first generation of Mars by Ryan Lewis. It's fictional, but it's meant to show that this child is clearly born on Mars. They won't know any different, which was similar to what Professor White said. They won't know any difference. So I thought that that narrative would be quite interesting to communicate. Carson's really good uh, illustration on the dystopian side of things. Um, so that was our approach. Guys, that's really interesting. Uh, but just a question, Tanya, and I guess Carson, why is that dystopian? Which part of this is dystopian? I mean, the image is quite dystopian. Um, but what's dystopian about knowing when you're going to get weather and when you're going to get cancer and being able to treat that, you know, sooner? I think the question is maybe about who has authority over this dust because currently I don't think there's any guidelines on 
who controls what yeah. fixes what. So even though if you have a fully functioning body, say if you did, were a political um, political opponent to someone else, someone else in power might just kill off you instantly because they have control over what's inside of you. Mm-hmm. So, so this is the danger of injection. You could have, like, could have like two or three types of disgust, right? From two or three different companies or, or entities. Um, and they could kind of, you know, monitor each other. So instead of having like just the smart dust from, I don't know, the American government, let's say, you know, you could have American smart dust. You could have smart dust from company X and smart dust from company Y kind of all watching over each other. That's, that's one of the solutions. This reminds me quite a bit of um, uh, uh, these nanobots, uh, great, great goo. If you've heard of the concept of great goo, the idea is like nanobots that transform everything else into nanobots uh, that, that kind of at the end end up being this great goo of nanobots. And one of the ideas for how to police against that sort of thing is that you have nanobots watching over the other kinds of nanobots, right? So maybe you can have, you know, different, different, I don't know, maybe you can think about different uh, watching over each other. and. That's the okay. Oh, could you have like different, like you said, providers, right? Who owns it, but could it be like different providers to different parts of that dust? Like, I mean, um, you know, in terms of ownership, for example, again, is it like the, you know, is it one body, is it the government or is it more kind of privacy preserving in a sense where you're like, not unlike now with data privacy, right? You have different companies that have access to different types of your information. Um, I kind of have this know. idea because it's like the modern electric cars we have, like Tesla today. I think if mm-hmm. you do some simple Googling, you find out it's pretty easy to hack into a car. So the security mm-hmm. systems are greatly flawed in the sense that the company itself cannot guarantee that they are in control of your car. So if say this dust somehow does get hacked or gets in controlled by someone else that is an enemy of yours, I think there's still the danger of these technologies being a dystopian type of idea or story mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think definitely the dystopian element of this is very like poetic Uh, in terms of a design perspective. You're right. Like I think that we should look to more positive if not a more productive way to look at it but I think this was just in the perspective of what if it was in the wrong hands like that was kind of our approach as well and like that kind of ignorance that comes with being uh, a human in Mars you know the first generation like what can they expect they must have such a identity crisis because those before them knew that um, there was a creation of culture on this planet whereas they are the ones who don't actually know uh, any different. So that was more of our approach. Mm-hmm. Nice drawings too. Thank you. So we have another group and then we should uh, probably wrap up this session or to uh, overextend the time. Uh, is there another well, group? I, that... then I can do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Virgo, you're falling asleep. <laughs> it's so late for you guys there. Thanks for staying can out. Can you see my screen and the uh, uh, written text on the side? Uh, we can see the illustration, but not the uh, not the text. But you can you can tell us the story. Um, so uh, I actually wrote the story, and Patricia did the illustration. It is about the father and son. Uh, our time is uh, one hundred years. I think it's two one hundred. And then our story is based on a son and a father, by which the son is a pure Mars born uh, teenager, and he, and they are going back to Earth and try to revisit their grandmas and grandma wants to uh, take them have a look around the earth something like that and between the conversation and uh, it shows the conflict at, at that moment between mars and earth which is mainly about the technology transfer because the martian wants to keep the technology but uh, they somehow need the resource from earth so they need, need to have trades and stuff and we also try to be more innovative, be more creative, and try to include some uh, new technology, such as, uh, I, I know Patricia said the, the specialized meal for every Martians because the food supply is limited and it is uh, a different, no different planet. Planet. 
yeah, yeah, something like that. And there are much more, but I think they are in the script. So I, I don't think I'm going to point it out one by one. Yeah, this is basically it. Sorry, just a quick question. I think I missed it. What's the time frame? To 100. That's like the late, yeah, the, the furthest one. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, warp drives make sense. We'll probably have them by then, maybe sooner. Any questions for from the other students about like this uh, this scenario or this story? What's the role of the little robot? Like, is it is it an actual character? Or, like, is it a person, uh, or do you consider just an appliance? So our story actually wrote that every person on Mars they have their own AI assistants, and the robot is actually officialized. AI assistants somehow. Because the AI assistant is just like Friday in Iron Man that he can, like she or he can do anything for you, like download the data and place it in your brain and help you organize it. And like uh, they um, it, it knows your health so uh, it can prepare your meals for you and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like a it's like a man like yeah, a servant. Yeah, yeah like servant, a... yeah. Perfect description. So are they, in your story, they will actually get back to Earth and meet the grandma? Or do you just want to tell the story in a stretch of the, the travel? Because uh, for Martian going back to Earth, you know, having much more gravity, if they were born on Mars, it's going to be pretty traumatic. You know, it, it might be very traumatic for us to go there, but coming back to Earth might, might feel extremely heavy, you know, and difficult. Like, would you want to tell the story, uh, that experience of going, coming back to Earth as a, as a negative story or... As a positive story, how, how do you envision it? Yeah, we didn't extend the story there at this moment because the story is only a few hundred words. So it is like, um, it, it starts with the father telling the son that they are about to go back Earth. And the story ends in the son knows more about the Earth's current moment, uh, kind of current state because we said that uh, as Mars and Earth is somehow in a competitive situation because they need they need trades and they have trade wars and something like that. So uh, we are saying that the Mars government is actually hiding some uh, truth about the Earth sometimes. Yeah, the story actually is something like this. Also for the visual language you're using, uh, like the father and the son are identical. So to me, they're clones, right? Uh, so it looks like there's no mother and just a world of men where men reproduce kind of uh, as a single cell <laughs> replication. <laughs> so uh, is that, is that no, your intention? No, that's actually an illustration problem. Some, yeah, they, they are just like na natural born son, not a clone like Star Wars. It's okay. just like normal human believing in Mars. <laughs> okay, because this, the, I mean, uh, maybe you, the son should look younger and maybe he's actually bigger than the father if he's born in less gravity, there's less limitation of growing. Maybe the heart is different, you know. Um, yeah, cool. Is this meant to depict the everyday life that you see 2100 being like? Is that like a correct way to see this? Uh, yeah, we tried to include those uh, elements all in the background so you can see how um, on the right there's um, like, it can show how, because uh, our brief uh, is about how connected and how we've merged now with uh, physically and uh, with machinery. Mm -hmm. So we can see how all the data is tracked and it um, and all the meals are customly made for you and how there's more sustainable consumption and how everything can be tracked easily at the back of the monitor. So um, I know it kind of, the computer kind of knows you better than you know yourself. And right. um, also in the background, we included some, um, uh, some more spaceships to show how they they really more trade and stations to refill resources and also how there's still some moderate activity going on with Earth. Right. Okay. Hey, what's the computer at the right? Uh, is that the, to me? I mean, I can't really see very clearly, but is that a, like a brain that's connected to a computer? This uh, the blue the blue one. 
and the right. Uh, yes, we read up a little bit on brain hacking and the brain computer interface, and it's still quite intimidating to us. But then uh, we got like uh, we got the idea that how like um, we we read an article about how um, you can instantly download any data you want from your brain. So that was what uh, we were inspired to draw that from. Okay, so while well, you connect your brain to that machine, basically. And uh, kind yes. of it's it's kind of like also dipping into the idea of like how like we're so assimilated with technology now and it's like in brainwashing us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, so both of the presentations have a little bit of a darker kind of spin right uh so far did i'm just curious uh did anyone like um think of like really positive utopic almost uh visions of the future and how this kind of technology might be applied You there, <laughs> uh, Babisha and Anson, did you get the question? Well, I guess it was for I anyone. Like for anyone else. Students, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Sorry, I'm actually struggling to hear things. I think it's the connection. It dropped. So both first presentation and second, I kind of just having to make up a lot of the stuff. Will these stories be available somewhere? Uh, I mean, I saw the guys share the screen now, so I could read a little bit. Uh, but all the others, um, will it be possible to kind of read through them? Yeah. Right after this uh, session, I will um, I will compile everything that has been submitted. I don't think everybody has submitted necessarily. I was looking into the into the folder, and mm -hmm. uh, not everybody. Uh, and also, I think a couple of you has have uh, uploaded super large file. So I think like we already maxed out one gigabyte in upload. So that might be the reason why everybody couldn't upload. So. Uh, I mean, uh, there's only like six groups. So, uh, and I allocated one gigabyte for six images, which I thought was very generous. But, uh, mm -hmm. but <laughs> so yeah, if you could upload your images uh, right after this class, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Uh, so at least we could, we could uh, give you some feedback. Otherwise we just cannot. Um, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. download whatever is already on there. Uh, if you haven't uploaded, uh, please do so. Um, Okay, I just want to uh, give the, uh, the instructions for uh, next week. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so, uh, so we had a couple of you guys sharing your, your, your stories. I was, I was hoping that I could, uh, you know, put all of you in the presentation so we could go through the timeline, but we didn't have the time or you guys didn't upload all of the images, uh, but that's, that's okay. Uh, so please uh, upload your images. So I did uh, aggregate. So what are we going to be doing for next week? Um, so well, first of all, if you haven't had finished your work for this week, I'm going to ask you to refine your story. So it means that uh, you can expand your story. So for example, today I was asking, okay, you're going back to earth. What happens? You know, uh, Expand your story and refine your story. And most importantly, I, I want you to pay special attention to the object, both for the two people who presented, two groups that presented, you talked about, for example, like a powder as a substance, uh, but you know, how does it look like? Does it have a packaging? Uh, and uh, for example, Zara and Martin mentioned that they might come from different brands. How is that manifested? And generally that's packaging, right? Or has it administered? Is it a dust that they just like spread into the space? Or is it something they have to like force feed into people's nose or, you know, so it's a very, very different relationship to the product. So I'd like you to um, focus a bit more on the product within the context of your story. So um, I'll ask you to expand on your story and expand on your object, uh, make more sketches. So basically you can write a longer story. Uh, so let's say once, once like 1000 words. And then refine the object, I'd like you to uh, start to do sketches about how your object looks like. If it's a powder, does it come into a container? Does it come into a, a pouch? Uh, does it come into a gun, a syringe? Is it a tablet? You, know, you start to elaborate. Um, if it's a brain control technology, is it you know, uh, ambient technology? Uh, like uh, what Martin was starting to point at. It's like a, a computer into your, into, your, into your tank and it's got like wires inside but it's not your brain, it's like an external brain. <laughs> so start to elaborate what is your, what is your object, what is your product? Uh, even if it's atmospheric, you know, uh, whether it's dust or if it's like a brain that's outside, it's not a, an appendage on people's body, but start to be more specific about uh, the, uh, the object. So uh, specifically it's 
1,000 words for the story. And I would say at least uh, 10 drawings for your objects or how it comes into different packaging. So you start to come up with different, uh, different ideas. Uh, I'll make the specific request. Uh, <laughs> don't exceed uh, 100 megabytes when you make the upload so that we can still Otherwise, my server is just going to crack just for like six images. I didn't expect that. So, so just uh, you know, don't upload like a 400 megabyte image because that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't make sense. It's a JPEG image, you know, like under, under 100 megabyte. I think it's very generous. Uh, do you guys have any questions for um, the assignments? Um, is it just um, objects during our timeline? Does it have to be showing like the background of space and everything? Or is it just like a blank drawing of, a, of the object? So, um, I mean, for the, for the two presentations that, that, that you just shared at the end, um, I really wanted to take some time to look at it because I wanted to get a sense of how you, you're telling your story. Uh, when I mentioned in the illustration, for example, I'm sure uh, Bavisha and, and Anson spend a lot of time making this illustration of collage. Uh, but I think you could say the exact same story just by making a hand sketch, you know, that, that would take you, you know, 10 times less time. So what I'm saying is that sometime uh, you may having shortcuts uh, that, you know, you can tell a much more complex story in much less time. And that's kind of where we should be at right now, instead of making like fancy renders, we're still at the early stages of making like a storyboard rather than making like, you know, like a f fleshed out uh, story. Um, I just to add to that, I don't know if you guys work with that, but for me as well, what I found useful at this stage is like it worked with images as well, you know, where they just create collage and like cut out and actual existing things. Um, because yeah, like, like the illustrations are nice, but it takes a lot of time. And especially if you have something specific in mind, it can be much harder to, to create that, then just find something existing as well, or just sketch it out by hand. Um, I just wanted to add two things as well. So um, one to what you already said, Cesar, in terms of just think of that whole journey of the product, but also the journey surrounding that of, you know, like it's packaging, but it's more than that, right? So the packaging is, you know, who is interacting with the product at each end, right? The receiving end, the kind of the production end, and the whole thing around that. So I think that can give you a lot of kind of ideas on how to create the object. Um, and another thing is, um, we touched on that, Frank mentioned that as well. And especially when you're thinking of the future, like really try to, when you're imagining objects, and I'm not talking about specific product, um, but just even the objects in the environment, like really try to question, right? So if you're putting like a chair there, a table, just question, well, is like, you know, 100 years from now in Mars, is that kind of the kind of product and um, object that will still be there? Does it even have the same utility? Um, so I think those things can really help you to kind of create a, a story around it um, if you're questioning. And I, I only saw the text of the first group and I really like that you kind of put a lot of questions there. Um, yeah. Um, also seen in the in the comments, while well, we have a discussion with uh, Professor White, that some of you wanted to ask more questions. I, I wanna make sure that we don't overwhelm him with like a hundred questions, but rather like just a few, you know, well thought out questions also researched because uh, I think a lot of things that we ask, he might have, you know, written about it or <laughs> most likely has written about it. So um, I would say um, that's another kind of assignment for next week is that if you wanna, um, if you wanna ask some questions to Professor White, you know, take the time to do a bit more research about what he said, maybe you watch some interviews of his, um, and then you can add them in the documents. And so let's not rush right now to like send him a bunch of questions because I think that would be, we don't want to waste his time. We want to respect his time very, very much. Um, so I would say that's the third assignment in addition to like 1000 words essay and, uh, and like a uh, most, uh, and then at least 10 sketches, uh, but also like refining your question uh, so we can make the most of, of that. Um, Erica, you want to ask a question? Ask if we would get any feedback, like for those who didn't present today, would we get feedback um, before we start on this part, on the yes. second assignment? Absolutely. So um, I, as, as I mentioned, I'm going to delete uh, on my server the images that have already been uploaded uh, so that you could, you could still upload. Um, if they do not fit, um, please send them to me uh, latest by tomorrow. Uh, so like this, I have the time to compile them uh, to share. Uh, so, oh no, better than that. I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to share this very presentation with you and you're going to have the editing rights on it. 
so that you can just drag and drop your image in this presentation and just copy paste your text in this presentation. That'd be a lot better. Because actually in this presentation, I, I had uh, prepared, uh, you can see my screen. I actually, I had prepared your, your, your illustration, but because most of them were, were, were missing, uh, yeah, we, we couldn't go through. So um, I'm gonna share right now the editing rights on this presentation. Please just edit this presentation and so that uh, Zera, uh, myself, uh, and Martin can, can look at them and then we will add comments uh, in the speaker's notes or just as comments in, in, in the side. Yeah. Yeah. So it's easier then. You know. yeah. I will do more for the first two groups as well because I think like I personally missed quite a bit. Uh, so it would be nice. Yeah, we'll give proper feedback on all of them. Yeah, looking forward to seeing. Uh, I'll share the presentation right now. Uh, so this you could all see. Um, uh, you could also get the, you, you get it right now. So this is the, so please add your images and text in this presentation and we will comment. Uh, do we have a speaker next week? Um, Sarah and Martin, or next week it's you guys? Uh, uh, this week it's us and the uh, workshop style session where we'll go through a bunch of tools that they can that they can play with i think no next um yeah i think i, I think the next speaker is robert zubrin dr robert zubrin and he's uh two weeks from now no so not not on the 23rd or 30th uh i might be getting the timing i i think he's on the 7th or is it 30th maybe he's on the 30th Great. Cool. Uh, any more questions? Okay. So I guess uh, I guess we're good. So um, what I suggest is that uh, for the so the submission for next week, actually just create extra slides on this deck. It would be even easier actually. I guess to submit. Uh, so you can just create a couple of more slides. Uh, you know, in, the, in your time zone. So at least we can see the progress between what you have done this week and the illustration that you have created for, for, uh, for the next. Um, does it sound good to you? So at least you don't have to like, go onto a Google form. We just edit in the same document. It's a lot easier to manage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Take you, care. guys. Good luck. Bye, guys. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.